everybody, we are going to pick up where we left off with head to toe assessment. Um, if you guys remember, we talked about airway, breathing, circulation, level of consciousness. So at any time, uh, if airway, breathing, circulation, and level of consciousness are okay, and we continue on down to do the head to toe assessment of the patient, we always monitor um, the patient's airway, breathing, and circulation. We monitor that continuously, and with the head to toe assessment, we stop that and go back to the ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation, and level of consciousness. We go back to that, um, and we omit that observation anytime things change, anytime a condition change. If the patient's are not able, unable to breathe on their own, um, if their airway is not uh, maintained open, if there's no heartbeat, if their level of consciousness changes, um, we may need to do full-on CPR or we may need to do rescue breaths or whatever we need to do for patients. So let's watch this little video real quick. And I'm hoping this time it actually works right. I've been having technical issues this week, so I apologize in advance. secondary surgery from the head to toe exam, this is going to be utilized in patients who have open airway in breathing at least one breath every five seconds, about 12 breaths a minute, but still might be unconscious and showing signs of shock, and emergency medical services have been activated and they're on the way. Now, let me just make one clarification. In a previous video, we've had some comments coming back to students that thought that I was sitting on the hand of the patient or the arm while we were doing the automated external defibrillator. It's important for you to understand that the proper position for doing a head to toe exam or rescue breathing to chest compressions is to extend the patient's arm out whenever possible, as long as there are no fractures, and for the rescuer to straddle but not sit on the arm or the hand of the patient. So don't make a mistake. I'm not sitting on the hand of the patient or on the arm. We're straddling the arm with the knees so that we're in a good balanced position to be able to treat from head to pelvis and not lose our balance. As we begin the head to toe exam, we start at the head, making sure that the airway is open. This is a patient that did not have a suspected neck injury, so we're not having to worry about moving the neck very much. There are no fallen ladders. Someone witnessed the patient going down, and we're not really too concerned about the fact that they have an unstable neck fracture. We check the top of the head and the skull, carefully for any uh, soft spots or any fracture points. Look at your hands that are gloved to make sure there's no bleeding. We're just feeling the behind the neck. We're checking the face, making sure nothing's in the mouth. We're going down one side, checking the arm for any obvious fractures, deformities, or bleeding. Checking the second arm, pressing lightly and carefully on each side of the chest, then softly on all four quadrants of the abdomen, checking the legs to make sure that there are no fractures or serious bleeding. And that's where we move to the next step, which would be treating any of those found injuries for fractures, serious bleeding. If there's soft spots on the head, we're not going to treat that. We're just going to be aware of that and let EMS know what it is when they come um, that we found some things and then continue to remember to support airway, breathing and circulation whenever applicable. Once we start treating for bleeding control, shock management, or anything like that, do not forget the ABCs. Those are the most vital part of buying time for this patient. Okay, guys, so you got to see um, the head to toe assessment piece there. So let's keep moving. Um, so this is just a quick Quizlet um, to get asked what you would do. Um, your neighbor is painting from his house from a ladder. You hear him cry out and you hear the ladder hit the concrete. When you arrive, he is on his back. His right arm is deformed and he is not moving. What is your assessment? What uh, is your assessment of this situation? So in order, uh, in order, what should we do for the victim? We need to manage airway, breathing and circulation. How do we, how do we determine airway, breathing, circulation? We would uh, look, listen, and feel. If we did not detect a breath and we needed to give rescue breaths or we were concerned about breathing ability or airway, we would use jaw thrust because we do not know if there's been a neck injury. 
and we're going to check the pulse. We're also going to call 911 and call out for anyone to help us that might be near that could hear us. Um, with his arm, we want to, we don't want to straighten it out. We want to, we want to stabilize it if possible. Otherwise, as long as there's no bleeding, we leave it alone. We do not leave the victim until help arrives, until medical professionals arrive. All right. So we're going to talk about shock and wounds in this section um, and how to, how to do first aid related to that. So wounds and shock, an average, so these are things you need to remember. An average adult has about six liters of blood. Rapid lo blood loss in an adult of one liter can lead to shock and death. One cup in a child, this is someone under 11, can, uh, can, be, uh, can lead to shock and death. And for an infant, an infant is anyone under the age of 12 months, just two tablespoons of, of blood can lead to shock and death. So um, we have to be aware of bleeding related to the kind of patient, whether it's an adult, a child, or an infant, and me being sure that we are taking care of any kind of bleeding as quickly as possible. Applying pressure. Um, we will look at tourniquets. It's not often that we have to apply a tourniquet, but there may be an issue at, or a time that you might need to due to excessive bleeding. And we'll talk about the different types of bleeding. We're talking about arterial and venous and capillary bleeds as well. Okay, so the definition of shock, um, you definitely will need to know, know this. Inadequate tissue or cell provision. What happens is over time with sh in shock, the body stops losing oxygen and nutrients to the, to the body systems and they start to shut down. And those systems start to, uh, and those tissues start to die. So shock is very serious. It must be treated as quickly as possible. But remember that shock is inadequate tissue or cell perfusion. Tissue perfusion. So that's the process of oxygen and nutrients getting to the cells and to the tissues. And the removal of waste, of waste products and carbon dioxide. Um, it is essential for, for normal, healthy life. So when people have circulatory issues, bleeding issues, respiratory issues, as we talked about in cardiopulmonary, it really affects the way tissues um, function and how they can replicate and survive. Causes of shock, you will need to know causes of shock. Um, trauma, generally related to blood loss. Trauma can be a fractured femur because you do lose an, a, quite a bit of blood when you have a femur, a femoral compound fracture. Illness such as nausea, vomiting, um, heat stroke, GI, uh, you know, any kind of GI issue or gastrointestinal issue where there's lots of vomiting, um, diarrhea, fever, things like the flu, um, really bad stomach bugs, um, food poisoning, all those things can lead to shock if they, if you can't hold enough fluid down and don't get treated. Um, heart disease, which means if you're unable to, to, perfuse or to send blood where it needs to go due to ca cardiac dysrhythmia or rhythm, rhythm pr problems in the heart, or if it's simply just because the heart has worn out or has some other kind of disease process and can't um, perfuse the body, that can lead to shock over time. Other gastrointestinal diseases such as absorption issues uh, where you don't absorb the right nutrients or can't absorb the right electrolytes, um, where there are um, acid-base balance issues related to nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Uh, Crohn's disease causes uh, electrolyte imbalances and cells um, and organ systems are affected by the fact that it can't, uh, waste can't be removed appropriately. Respiratory issues, so someone who has COPD or CHF, um, COPD and CHF, or um, they may have severe asthma. Those are things that inhibit ox appropriate oxygen supply. So in that case, that could lead to shock because oxygen is not, is not being dispersed to the cells and the tissues. Allergic reaction that causes bronchospasms or difficulty breathing um, and rapid heart rate and it changes circulation. Head injuries, where the brain can't tell the body to circulate uh, blood appropriately, where it can't tell the body um, how to maintain a, a, its 
all of its, its homeostasis. Spine injuries, they can result in the ability um, from, for blood vessels to be able to constrict or, or dilate do, depending on where that spinal injury is and the severity of it. So you may still not be perfusing related to a head or a spine injury. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the three types of shock. Um, there are four things listed in here, and fainting or syncope does fall under shock, but technically it is not shock. It is not a type of shock. So there are three types of major shock, and then fainting does fall under this because it could lead to some serious issues. So hypovolemic shock or hemorrhagic shock is generally due to blood loss or fluid, fluid loss. Cardiogenic shock is specific to the heart. Anaphylactic shock is related to an allergic reaction. And then fainting can be related to changes in blood pressure, electrolytes, multiple things. And we're going to talk about each type and how, what we need to do to help take care of a, a victim. So hypovolemic shock is caused by blood loss, dehydration, diarrhea, fluid, fluid volume deficit. So hypo means low volume, uh, volemic, vol, V-O-L, vol means like volume, uh, and emic, you know, means related to blood. So it's low blood volume. So it's it, low blood volume can be due to um, actual bleeding, um, dehydration due to vomiting, um, uh, heat, heat stroke where you've had excessive sweating. Um, if someone has serious burns, where their skin is not holding in their body fluids. Uh, those are things that can cause some of the causes of hypovolemic shock. Um, things that you're going to see, and you're going to see some things that are similar and a few differences in hypovolemic, anaphylactic, and cardiogenic. I would be able to compare and contrast all three types of shock. So when, when early on with hypovolemic shock, you're going to see restlessness and irritability. Um, they're just going to feel like something's wrong. They're going to be really anxious. They're going to have an altered level of consciousness, which means they may go from being able to talk to you clearly and um, being alert to person, place, and time to being very disoriented. They'll have a very weak but rapid pulse. So it's very fast because the body's still trying to keep up and circulate what blood it has, but it's very weak. Skin is generally pale due to volume loss, but it will also be kind of clammy or moist feeling. Um, they're going to try to breathe rapidly to bring oxygen into the, what blood there is to keep that pulse, uh, keep that um, blood, the blood that is still circulating um, oxygenated. They're going to be nauseated and potentially have um, and be vomiting due to fluid volume loss, due to pain, multiple reasons that they could have the nausea and vomiting. Um, their eyes are going to look dull, not bright and shiny, and they may appear sunk in where you they look like they're further back in the eye socket than they should be. Their pupils may become dilated, which means the black part of the eye is large and it doesn't change when light hits it. Um, and you're going to see some kind, types of injuries, bruising, bleeding, cuts. Um, so you have to be, on, when there's hypovolemic shock or, or um, obvious vo excessive vomiting and diarrhea, you're going to have to be looking for it because this is generally something that you will be able to see why that volume level has decreased. You're going to see that treatment is a sim is similar for many cases of shock, um, but you're going to but, but there are differences. So be sure you know the differences and the similarities as well. Be able to compare and contrast treatment as well. So always with every type of shock or any time we have an injured victim, we're going to manage airway, breathing, circulation, and call nine one one. That's going to be first. We're always going to man manage airway, breathing, circulation, and call nine one one. Then if they're bleeding, we're going to apply direct pressure. We're going to elevate it and try to elevate above the level of the heart whatever is bleeding while we're applying direct pressure. Um, we're going to look at pressure points on the body. And if it's possible, besides applying direct pressure, if we're able to go above the wound and apply pressure to a pressure point, which is 
a specific junction in an um, from the artery, we want to try to do that. We want to never remove soaked dressings. We just want to add more dressings on and continue to apply pressure. Um, we want to make sure when blood volume gets low, people get cold. Um, blood is our blood is 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit circulating in our body. That's what keeps our body in a normal, uh, helps keep our body at a normal temperature. So we want to be sure that if we can, we can cover that person up. Even if it's even if it's hot outside, we still want to cover someone who is losing excessive fluid up um, because it could because it can also help um, keep blood circulating a little better. Um, if it's not contraindicated, that means depending on the type of shock or the injury, we want to elevate the leg, the legs 12 inches if possible. All right, let's watch a video on treating. Sorry, guys. Let me try this one more time. On treating hypovolemic shock. Well, this must be one of the ones I have to copy and paste. I have a couple on here that are so low down, I have to copy and paste them. So let me try to copy and paste this one in here so we can watch it. Give me just a second. I'm sorry. Shock is a condition resulting from inadequate oxygen supply to the body tissues and major organs and will accompany any injury or illness to some degree. Shock may also be caused by loss of body fluids, damage to the heart, standing still for too long, a sudden emotional shock, fear, pain or an unpleasant experience. Follow the DRS ABCD action plan and treat the cause of shock if possible. If the casualty is conscious, lay them down and raise the legs. Comfort them, keep them warm and reassure. Do not give the casualty anything to eat or drink. Most external bleeding will be minor and usually stops within 10 minutes through the blood clotting. For minor bleeding, apply direct hand pressure to the wound until bleeding stops. Clean if necessary and then cover with a clean or sterile dressing. Sometimes though, bleeding may be life-threatening if the damaged blood vessel is large or the blood is under too much pressure for effective clotting to occur. To manage major or deadly bleeding, examine the wound for embedded objects, apply pressure to stop the bleeding, elevate if possible, restrict movement and ideally immobilise the part. A significant amount of bleeding may occur with wounds to the head and face. Bleeding is usually controlled with direct pressure, but care must be taken to avoid pressing onto a possible fractured skull. Here, it's all right. It's okay. It's spongy. Yeah. Assess the surrounding area. If a depression, sponginess or bone fragments are felt under the skin, do not apply pressure directly onto the wound. Attempt to control the bleeding with pressure around the wound, perhaps with a donut bandage. Once a fracture of the skull has been eliminated, direct hand pressure may need to be maintained because of the difficulty of bandaging the head firmly enough to control the bleeding. To treat a person with a nosebleed, sit the casualty with the head forward. The nostrils are pinched over the soft fleshy area at the end of the nose bone for at least 10 minutes. Instruct them to spit out any blood, breathe through the mouth, and not to blow the nose. If bleeding continues, reapply pressure for a further 10 minutes. If bleeding persists, seek medical attention. When a tooth is knocked out, control the bleeding first, and once controlled, try to save the tooth. Instruct the casualty to bite down firmly on a pad placed over the tooth socket. To preserve the tooth, it may be sucked clean or washed in the casualty's saliva or in a little milk. Water should never be used to wash the tooth. 
nor should the root of the tooth be handled, as it may cause the tooth to die. In the event of an amputation, firstly manage the stump by applying direct pressure and elevation, then provide rest and reassurance to the casualty. Manage shock, then care for the amputated body part. Retrieve the part and place it in a sealed plastic bag without washing, labelled with name of the casualty and the time of amputation. Place the sealed plastic bag into a container of water and ice and transport with the casualty. When a foreign object such as a knife, glass, branch or stick is embedded in a wound, do not remove the object as it may be acting as a plug. Apply pressure around the object using a donut bandage. Penetrating, embedded or puncture wounds and any bites have a high risk of becoming infected and medical treatment needs to be sought. Okay, guys. So that helped you see, I'm sorry, everything, um, my computer is running really slow today. Um, but as you can see, that's um, some uh, ways to treat shock. So when do we not elevate the legs? These are reasons we didn't. We should not elevate the legs. If the patient is unconscious, so we don't know what happened to them, we don't want to increase pressure on the brain if they were to have a head injury or any kind of issue. Also, um, we don't want to elevate the legs if they're having chest pain, if we think they're, if they're having difficulty breathing, because that just increases pressure to the chest and changes the work and the respiratory load. It, it increases their effort. Also, if there's a spinal injury or a potential neck injury, we do not want to move their spine or head or neck um, unless we know that there is not, a, if, that, unless we know for sure there's not any kind of risk of injury. Okay, so um, just remember reasons not to elevate the legs. Now we're going to move on to cardiogenic shock. Cardiogenic shock. Um, Cardiogenic shock generally is related to the heart's inability to pump blood the, where it needs to go. So it's actually um, when the heart is unable to send blood effectively throughout the body. So when we talked about the atria and the ventricles pumping, um, they're just not pumping blood the way they should. So what we need to do is we need to... Um, we need to be sure that um, we understand that that lots of times cardiogenic shock can be related to either the heart being worn out or illness, or it can be related just to electrical issues. So signs and symptoms, they're going to be blue. Their skin's going to have a bluish purple color, especially around the mouth and nose. Um, they may have symptoms of a heart attack, like shortness of breath, difficult. Um, difficulty breathing, um, tightness in their chest. They may have nausea, vomiting, jaw pain. Um, they may have uh, pain to the left arm. They're going to have, they may feel dizzy or weak. Um, and also, their skin is generally going to be cool to the touch. So you want to be sure that you know some signs and symptoms of cardiogenic shock. Uh, and just be sure that... Um, that you that you um, know that it's similar to a heart attack and that they're going to have bluish colored um, they'll have a bluish colored uh, purple color to their skin especially around the mouth and nose treatment once again you're going to manage the abc's airway breathing circulation and call 911 as soon as possible. Keep the patient in a sitting position but with their legs dangling down because we do not want to overload. Um, we don't want to overload their um, their chest. Their, their, we don't want to increase pressure to the chest. We want, don't want to make the heart work any harder than it, it already is trying to. Um, and then we begin CPR if the patient becomes unconscious at any time. Anaphylactic shock. 
Anaphylactic shock is something related, something we think about when we think about um, when we think about um, people getting stung by bees, people being allergic to nuts, fish, shellfish, certain berries, um, antibiotics, bee stings. Those are things that are their exposure exposure to allergens. Anaphylactic shock is an exposure to something you are allergic to. And when that happens, then we need to see or we need to make sure that we understand that um, that, that is something that's very serious and we need to take care of as quickly as possible. So most of you know if there's someone in your, cla in your class that... Um, Ashlyn Stokes, please come to the office. Ashlyn Stokes, please come to the office. Sorry, guys. We, you need to know that, um, you know, if there is something that, if someone has that issue, know that they absolutely um, need to be treated immediately. Most people will have an EpiPen or they'll let you know, you'll know ahead of time if they're allergic to certain things. Maybe not necessarily insects or bee stings. But usually if they're allergic to nuts or um, certain things that are readily available, they'll, they'll let you know in advance. Now, the seriousness or the thing that is truly a big deal is that, um, is that anaphylactic shock, um, people can go from breathing to um, death in as little as 30 seconds to 30 minutes. So we have to be very careful and, and manage that very ma manage that um, as quickly as possible. If someone eats something, they're going to start to have a swelling in their face, throat, eyes, and hands. We're not necessarily going to have hives or itching. They may not start out there. They'll have a high-pitched cough and wheezing sound and have extreme difficulty breathing. And what's happening is the, the bronchial tubes that lead down into the alveolar sacs, like we learned about with respiratory, is there a, a really thick, um, they're having a reaction to where the, the airways are um, swelling and then they're having a spasm at the same th time, so it's blocking off their airway. Uh, and that happen, it can happen very rapidly to some people. So the first thing you want to do in a situation, if someone has and is having an allergic reaction, is we want to we want to see if they have an EpiPen available, and we want to go ahead and administer that EpiPen. Um, we want to manage airway, breathing, circulation, and call nine one one immediately. Once again, ask about that EpiPen. Uh, if they have that, go ahead and administer it. And be prepared because you will may need to administer CPR very, very quickly. All right, let's watch a video on anaphylactic treatment. Anaphylaxis is a severe allergic reaction which is potentially life-threatening. It should always be treated as a medical emergency requiring immediate treatment. Anaphylaxis occurs after a person with a severe allergy is exposed to a trigger, usually food, insect sting or medication. Do you like some of my sandwich? Did my mum told me not to share food at school. Oh, it's really good. Okay, just, 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 just. Anaphylaxis often occurs within 20 minutes of exposure to the allergen. Signs and symptoms may include history of the allergy, raised lumps on the skin, perhaps in the form of a rash, swelling of the face, hoarse voice, sudden severe coughing or sneezing, perhaps wheezing or obvious difficulty in breathing. The more rapidly the anaphylactic reaction develops, the more life-threatening it is. If the casualty has prescribed medication, such as an EpiPen or Anapen, they should be assisted to administer it. Okay, so you've seen, we're going to watch how to administer. This little fella will show you quickly how to administer. And I'm going to move over until it shows him administering his epi hand. Oh, there? Yep. Did you hear sick? He has to tell a grown up right away. He has special medicine that he can take and he never goes anywhere without his medication. 
He also wears a wristband called a medic alert. This reminds him and others that he has food allergies. You can never tell if a food is safe for Hayden just by looking at it. Some of these foods are safe and some are not. We don't know unless we look at the ingredients. Even though there are lots of foods that Hayden can't eat or touch, there is even more that he can eat. We have lots of fun finding cool ways to make food safe for Hayden. Okay, we're going to stop with that. I just want you to say some of the things that you would normally see with someone, that, that medic alert bracelet, those kind of things. Um, just be sure that you are um, looking for those things as well with someone. Okay, we're going to talk about feigning real quick. Um, feigning does fall under the category because some of the treatment is a little similar. Um, fainting generally happens because there is an interruption of blood flow to the brain, generally because blood has pooled into the, the lower extremities, into the legs. So if you stand for quite a, for a long period and you lock your knees, it can cause you to pass out. It causes the blood to pool at the bottom of the legs. Um, also, um, if someone has extreme stress, um, where they are scared or overly excited or anxious or how are they um, hyperventilate, it can cause them to pass out. Um, feigning, though, in the elderly, someone over 55 or 60, we have to be, be real careful with feigning in that uh, instance because sometimes it's, it, it tends to be more related to a heart problem. So in the elderly, they should see a physician as soon as possible to rule out a cardiac issue that's causing them to faint. Now, um, with all of our shocks, airway, breathing, and circulation has been one of the biggest things that we needed to manage. Airway, breathing, circulation, call 911. Feigning is a little bit different. That's not the first treatment. Okay, so signs and symptoms, they'll get dizzy. Their skin will get pale, cool and moist to the touch. They may have nausea, and then they may pass out. Um, and usually kind of in that order. Um, sometimes people pass out from their blood pressure changing. When they go from sitting to standing real quick, it'll cause them to pass out. So we need to be aware of that. Um, treatment, we want to, if possible, help them not, ease them to the ground so that they don't hit their head or injure their back. Um, if there's no obvious injuries, we want to elevate the legs, loosen any tight clothing around the neck, um, try to keep the forehead uh, a cool cloth over on the forehead in, in under the arms. That's always um, helpful. If the person uh, um, is going to vomit or has vomited, you want to turn them on their left side and kind of bend their knees towards them. And then once they come around, you want to slowly sit them up, have them sit up, assess them for injuries, uh, assess their level of consciousness. Once they've sat there for a while, then the next thing we need to do is we need to, um, you know, just monitor them for just a little bit and then um, have them go from sitting, from laying to sitting, sitting for several minutes, then from sitting to standing where they are standing with you with assistance for several minutes before they start to walk. Um, if they get dizzy when they stand up, we ease them back down and we keep an eye on them for Oh, um, for as long as needed so that um, they can um, so that they can manage uh, to get uh, into a position where they're comfortable. If they continue to main, be dizzy when they stand, then we may still need to call 911 and get them treatment. OK, we are going to we're going to go through Quizlet 2 really quick and then we will talk about causes of bleeding next time. Bleeding and causes of bleeding and types of bleeding and wounds next. So Quizlet 2, or our next question is you're watching your, um, your, your daughter perform her first junior high chorus, a choral concert. Um, she suddenly starts to weave back and forth and then collapses on the ground. What's your assessment of the, of the situation? What type of shock has occurred? She has fainted. Um, why did it occur? Um, it occurred because she stood with her legs locked um, while singing. What are we going to do? We're going to elevate her legs 12 inches. We're going to hopefully she and assess her to see if there's any kind of head injury. Um, and then if she comes around, we'll continue to assess her condition, let her sit up slowly, and we'll call 911 if needed. All right, you guys, have a great day, and I will be back with you again tomorrow. Thank you, or next week. Thank you.